Hello, I'm Renee Fleming, co-chair of the NeuroArts Blueprint Initiative. I'm excited to welcome you today to our first progress report on the NeuroArts Blueprint. It's hard to believe that it's only been a year since we unveiled the Blueprint and its long-term vision for combining music, visual arts, design, dance, and other art forms with the proven rigor of mainstream medicine and public health. This first year has been remarkably vigorous and productive, and we are thrilled with our progress so far. NeuroArts has captured the attention of an expanding network of researchers, practitioners, arts groups, health providers, and other public and private sector organizations from around the world. We're honored to serve as a hub to share the growing body of research and practice and to act as a catalyst to build the field. We've made great strides in breathing life into our five recommendations. It's my pleasure to introduce our co-chairs, Susan McSammon and Ruth Katz, so that they can walk you through what we've achieved during this first year and to share with you our exciting plans for 2023. Susan and Ruth, I turn the floor over to you. Hello and welcome. Thank you for Zooming in and thank you, Renee, for your thoughtful comments on the blueprint. We value your leadership and strong support for building the field. And we're thrilled to see so many, such a great turnout for today's webinar. I'm Susan Magsamen, Director of the International Arts and Mind Lab at Johns Hopkins, and also the co-director of the Neural Arts Blueprint. And I'm Ruth Katz, Executive Director of the Health Medicine Society Program at the Aspen Institute, and along with my friend and colleague, Susan, co-director of the Neural Arts Blueprint Initiative. We've gathered today to share some exciting new updates for the Neural Arts Blueprint and the field of neural arts more broadly. It's hard to believe that it's been a year since the blueprint was released. We've had so many amazing accomplishments in the field over the last year, and we wanted to shout out a few of the colleagues that have been so active in doing this work. First, I'd like to shout out uh, the National Organization of Arts and Health and its curriculum. Americans for the Arts are doing great policy work, National Endowment for the Arts, Sound Health Network, and the Kennedy Center. The launch of the Jamal Arts and Health Lab in collaboration with the World Health Organization, the National Institutes of Health Toolkit, which you'll learn more about shortly, and the incredible work of local community arts organizations, and also the great work that is happening by many to advance social prescribing. It is an honor to be part of this vibrant and growing community. Today, we want to share the accomplishments of the NeuroArts Blueprint Initiative since releasing the report in December 2021, and also outline objectives and goals for the coming year. We'll, we will conclude with a Q&A segment, so please submit your questions using the Q&A feature. We want to begin, however, by thanking and recognizing everyone who's with us today and beyond for all your support. This is truly a collaborative effort. It has been from its inception and will continue to be so through all the hard work that lies ahead. To build on the field of neural arts from innovative research and on the ground practice to impactful policy and sustained funding, it truly will take all of us, each and every one of us. Next slide, please. To put today's progress report into context, we thought it would be helpful to remind you of some key information about the blueprint and underscore each of their importance. First, the primary goal of the work, which as you can see on the screen, is to ensure that the arts and the use of the arts in all of its many forms become part of mainstream medicine and public health. Underlying this mission is a commitment to under-resourced and marginalized communities around the world. Indeed, it is absolutely vital to our work. But to get there, we must first build the field at a global level. The field of neural arts, which brings together scientists and researchers, practitioners, educators, as well as the general public, all of whom already know and understand the contribution of the arts to good health and well being. And to do that, at every step of the way, the fundamental principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion must be interwoven into the fabric of our work. But I think you will agree new fields are not built in a day or even in five years, and that's the time frame for implementing the recommendations laid out in the blueprint. Like other disciplines, such as bioethics and environmental science, which before coalescing into recognized fields, 
They also were just an assortment of fragmented programs and activities. Just like those, the burgeoning field of neural arts requires cultivation and a multi-pronged strategy. It will take evidence. It will take resources. It will take a robust communication strategy. And it will take a community of activists, if you will, who are committed to building a sustainable future where the arts are part of good health and infused in all of our institutions. Next slide, please. A second reminder, how we define the term neural arts. The blueprint defines neural arts as the study of how the arts and aesthetic experiences measurably change the body, brain, and behavior, and how this knowledge is translated into specific practices that advance health and well-being. This definition comes out of and builds on the rich scientific research foundation established through the disciplines of cognitive neuroscience, empirical aesthetics, public health, art therapy, and arts and health. Next slide, please. More pragmatically, neural arts brings together arts plus health and science and technology. It is a term that actually captures the collaboration among these intersecting specialties, at which all of them have laid out the groundwork for cultivating the field of neural arts and its growth. And I wanna highlight just for a moment, the role of technology. We believe that along with the arts and sciences, technology is a key catalyst that has already provided the tools to help us measure the impact of arts and scientific experience on health and well being, and to foster greater dissemination and actual scaling. Next slide, please. A third reminder a quick summary of the five recommendations that came out of the Neural Arts Blueprint Report. Each is absolutely fundamental in building the field of neural arts. First, we want to strengthen the research foundation of neural arts. Second, we honor and support the many arts practices that promote health and well being. Third, we want to expand and enrich educational and career pathways. Fourth, we need to advocate for sustainable funding and promote effective policy. And finally, we need to build capacity, leadership, and communication strategies. Next slide, please. So what have we been up to for the past year in implementing these five recommendations? In a moment, Susan will walk us through some specifics. But to put those specifics into context, I want to take a moment to explain our organizing principles in taking on these various activities that you'll hear about. To put it simply, to build the field of neural arts, we need to put some big building blocks in place. So to implement our five recommendations, we've developed three, building evidence, building infrastructure, and building community. Some brief comments about each of those. First, building evidence. The Neural Arts Blueprint envisions a role for traditional research designs, such as randomized clinical trials, as well as for community-based participatory research, economic analyses, qualitative narratives, and learning strategies that draw on the lived experiences of research subjects, arts practitioners, and the communities that will serve by the field. Clearly articulated outcome measures and reporting guidelines are really essential to gather and make optimum use, optimal use of rigorous evidence as it accumulates, and also to demonstrate the investment that will help attract funding, inform policy, and bring the arts into the mainstream of medicine and public health, again, our primary goal. Building infrastructure. A solid infrastructure is crucial to support the dynamic cross-disciplinary partnerships that are fundamental to a strong field, including evidence that I just noted, but also pioneering programs and practices, innovative policymaking and educational and training pathways. We need the organizational scaffolding and mechanisms to align research and practice activities with policy and to plant the seeds for secure and sustainable funding. Finally, a few comments about building community. A diverse, 
agile and vibrant global community is the linchpin of efforts to coalesce and grow the field of neural arts. We need an all hands on deck approach with researchers, arts practitioners, artists, technology pioneers, local advocates, funders, policymakers, educators, clinicians, and of course, individuals with lived experiences all must be on board. Fostering a communications network that connects these stakeholders and cultivates new, even bigger audiences is essential to make that happen. Let me now turn the camera over to Susan, who will share some of the specific actions we have taken over the last year in constructing these building blocks. Susan? Thank you, Ruth. Next slide, please. In early 2022, we created a three-phase implementation plan with advice from the community and our advisory council. I will, take, I will talk about phase one in a moment, but here is a brief overview of the, each of these phases. At the end of these phases, we hope to have created a solid foundation for the future of the field. Let me zero in on our phase one priorities. Next slide. This graphic illustrates the key phase one action steps we identified in the blueprint to implement the recommendations and how they align to the priority framework of building evidence, infrastructure, and community. What's important about this slide is that we've identified targeted activities around the core building blocks, and we've begun to work on each of these, which I'll share in a moment. In all of these areas, the backdrop for moving these three building blocks forward is policy and sustainable funding, both of which are emerging as we continue to build evidence, infrastructure, and community. Next slide. As we shared, we are pleased to let you know that we are on track with the implementation timeline. In 2022, we have, in the evidence area, identified research priorities, which are nerd generation, rehabilitation, mental health, and child development. We've commissioned a second stage of a true value economic analysis that builds upon our first analysis released last year, indicating a significant benefit to the US economy for the use of music as a medical intervention for individuals with Alzheimer's disease. The second economic analysis will be a true value analysis, and it examines the impact on the quality of life for people living with Alzheimer's disease and their caregivers. And we've initiated an arts brain map to identify current neurobiological knowledge, gaps, challenges, and benefits, and identify in consultation with other stakeholders topics for the white paper to advance the field. In infrastructure, we've initiated the development of the Neuro Arts Resource Center. We've assembled a new advisory board and a research committee to guide the blueprints implementation and fostered the growth of the community neuroarts coalitions, including uh, highlighting case studies and a survey of the field. We had a robust webinar in December highlighting some pilots, including the work of the Laurie M. Tisch Illumination Fund and the Palm Health Foundation. Promising pilots are occurring, including Arts KC in Kansas City and Palm Health Foundation in Florida. And if you haven't already, please take a few minutes to complete the survey, which is in the chat link around community neural arts coalitions. In community, we've developed messaging for key audiences. We've been working with Macon Health, a global communications firm on the positioning statements that we are very excited about and we'll be sharing later this year. And we've hosted global neural arts webinars. We have been thrilled to see how the robust and well attended these are. And we look forward to continuing to talk with you in the future. And we've engaged stakeholders across a range of platforms, both in person and virtually. One of the biggest successes in the past year was beginning work on the Neuro Arts Resource Center. Next slide, please. Essential to successfully implementing the Blueprint's three building blocks is the Neuro Arts Resource Center. It is a highly interactive and continually updated compilation of Neuro Arts research related, re related research, clinical findings and arts practices from around the world across all art modalities and for all outcomes. The center provides a global directory of researchers, practitioners, and other neuro arts stakeholders. 
The center will foster communications and collaborations across interdisciplinary fields by providing a virtual watering hole for its stakeholders to share, connect, and collaborate on research, practice, funding opportunities, and upcoming events. The center will also house resources for policymakers, funders, and relevant professional associations. Next slide. We were honored to share the blueprint all over the world in 2022, and we presented before numerous conferences and gatherings and have been mentioned in a number of media outlets and have been contacted by interested supporters literally around the world. It is a privilege to work to build so many collaborations and new partnerships. Now we're gonna take a transition to look at the activities for 2023. Next slide. You've just heard what the Blueprint has initiated in 2022 and about the NeuroArts Resource Center. I now wanna discuss additional activities for 2023. In addition to these priorities, we are also continuing to work on what we began in 2022. In evidence, we're refining and sharing the research agenda, completing the true value economic analysis, continuing development of the arts brain map, publishing field-driven white papers, and working with others to develop a policy framework. In infrastructure, we are building the Neuro Arts Resource Center, convening the Advisory Council and Research Committee, managing and growing the Community Neuro Arts Coalition, activating the Academic Research Consortium, and beginning to cultivate sustainable funding pathways. In community, we are targeting messaging for key audiences, supporting educational pathways and curricula with partners, creating an awards and fellowship program, continuing to host webinars and convenings and continuing stakeholder engagements at global conferences and gatherings. All of these activities will lead to a stronger field. I know I've covered a lot of ground. If you'd like a copy of the slides, please let us know at info at neuroartsblueprint.org. This webinar itself is, will be available on the website shortly. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Ruth. Next slide, please. To take on these activities and complete them, and so many others to come, we are laser focused on raising the funds necessary to get the job done, and in turn, always to achieve the blueprints goal. So we want to acknowledge and thank here our funders to date, those organizations that you see listed on this slide. We are especially excited to announce our most recent supporter just within the last week or so, a real visionary actually, in bringing the arts and health together and that is the Lori M. Tisch Illumination Fund. With this gift, the fund has recognized our momentum and progress that we've made in building the field of neural arts. We thank them and again, all of our funders for their ongoing support. Over the last year, we have also forged strong relationships with partners across the field who have embraced the blueprint and enhanced its potential. We've talked to people, as Susan mentioned, literally around the globe, about this work and have established lasting relationships with community arts programs such as Palm Health in Florida and Arts KC in Kansas City, working to integrate neural arts into their own program. And we very much look forward to cultivating many more of these kinds of relationships. Next slide, please. Now, we've just hit the highlights today of our many accomplishments over the last year and We've shared just some of our plans for 2023. We invite you to read our full progress report and learn more about the neural arts recommendations by going to neuroartsblueprint.org. Next slide, please. Now, many of you have written to us sharing your own efforts and helping to implement various aspects of the blueprint and asking for more information about it. We're most grateful for all those messages, literally hundreds of them. But the question we get more often by far and away than any other, in fact, I see there, these, this very question is, some of you have already raised it in the chat, which is, how do I get involved? So here are several ways that you can help build the incredible field of neural arts. You can serve as an ambassador for the neural arts field. Share the blueprint and progress report with your colleagues and friends. Sign up for the Neural Arts Blueprint newsletter and join our webinars. As Susan has noted, we held several in 2022. This is our first of 2023. There will surely be more to come. 
partner on the various blueprint action steps that we have just laid out. And be sure to tell us how the resource center, which we are just beginning to build out, can best benefit you and your own work. Next slide, please. I wanna close our presentation actually with where I began, a reminder of the Blueprint's mission. But this time also as a reminder of how we will achieve that mission. And that is by working together. So a slightly revised mission statement, working together, yes, working together, we can ensure that the arts and the use of the arts and all of its many forms become part of mainstream medicine and public health. Yes, we really are all in this together. Now we wanna to get to your questions, but before we do, we wanna turn things over to two very special guests, Emmeline Edwards, who is Director of the Division of Extramural Research with the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, and Sunil Ingegaard, Director of the Office of Research and Analysis with the National Endowment for the Arts. We've asked them to join us with some comments on the state of the field of neural arts from the perspective of their respective institutions. Um, Emmeline, let's start with you. The Aspen stage is all yours. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to participate into this uh, webinar this afternoon. And actually, um, my comments are going to dovetail very nicely on uh, the last uh, sentence that uh, Ruth just uh, you know, uh, uh, mentioned, the idea of having the art become part of uh, you know, com, uh, conventional <laughs> medicine. And this is what the NIH is all about. Uh, at the NIH, we've been very much involved in building the evidence and uh, supporting the premise that uh, the arts actually impact uh, health. And so uh, we're very pleased to, to let you know that for the past couple of years, we have um, really increased the number of investigators that are involved in uh, the, this field of research. From the outset, we had focused on uh, music as an art form because this is where uh, most of the evidence uh, was, was the strongest. So currently we have about uh, 25 to 30 investigators that are looking at not only how music impacts the brain and the body, but also exploring the potential that music has therapeutic benefits. And these efforts really culminated in uh, this past November we had a, a fantastic uh, symposium at the Society for Neuroscience, uh, which is the premier uh, you know, um, meeting for neuroscientists. And uh, we had a symposium on uh, music and brain circuitry. And uh, the focus was on uh, using different me methods to actually unravel the circuitry by which music impacts a number of systems such as you know, uh, the motor system, uh, the reward system, and also cognitive system. Now, uh, this symposium actually was extremely well attended. The Society for Neuroscience brings over, it's an international meeting that brings over investigators from all over the world, um, experienced investigators as much as, as um, and also trainee. And this meeting really garnered uh, over a thousand participants. And we actually uh, have uh, a review paper that summarized uh, the, the work that was presented at this uh, meeting. And it's in the chat. We provided for you the links if you're interested in reading more about this. Now, the reason we're interested in uh, understanding the circuitry is really to uh, strengthen uh, the premise that uh, music-based uh, intervention actually can impact uh, have, uh, have targets in the brain and the body. So another major effort that's funded by the Rene Foundation the Re uh, and uh, also the Rene Fleming Foundation and the Foundation for the N NIH was the NIH toolkit for music-based intervention. While a lot of work is being done uh, by uh, you know, uh, scientists across the globe uh, looking at the impact of music on various conditions, the majority of the studies are very small and not done in a consistent way. So the NIH toolkit really is a, um, a set of guidelines 
and a set of uh, common data elements that investigators should utilize uh, when they are designing uh, music-based intervention so that they can uh, adhere to the rigor and reproducibility policy of the NIH. I'm happy to tell you that uh, the paper uh, summarized in uh, those discussions that we've had with expert panels is coming out in the May issue of the journal Neurology, but it's already uh, online. And again, I've provided uh, the, the link on the chat. Uh, once this comes out, our plans is really it to, is to do full dissemination uh, through uh, not only blogs, but also we plan to do a full institute of how to use the toolkit. And also uh, we are planning a, a, a more, um, you know, strategic planning effort uh, workshop in the fall. And of course, we're developing some funding opportunity announcements. So keep an eye out for these things coming out. Finally, I want to mention a very interesting experiment that actually took part in in October. This is our social prescribing, which is the goal uh, eventually. This is the blue sky goal for you know um, the arts to actually be able to uh, provide um, an opportunity to have the art prescribe uh, for various uh, you know condition. And uh, the, the, the Harvard Innovation Lab actually did an experiment in October where they invited a very diverse group of uh, you know, stakeholders, scientists, uh, social scientists, um, um, insurance uh, you know, providers, community uh, you know, our organization to actually talk about what does it mean to design a social prescribing experiment and while this was a very broad effort, it really did not focus on any particular art form. The idea was to get a, a good understanding of what will it take to get there. And what we learned was that really a lot of unusual collaboration across diverse uh, stakeholders group would be a critical way to address this. And so uh, I put the, in the link uh, in the chat as well, the link to the report that came out of those discussion. So a lot of groups are working on that. So we're moving forward, not only in research, but also in potential ways of actually including that into the ecosystem of uh, you know, the arts. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Sunil Iyengard from uh, the National Endowment for the Art uh, for his comments. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And it's, it's always such a pleasure to follow um, Follow Dr. Uh, Edwards and very inspiring, of course. Um, so uh, we are very pleased at the National Endowment for the Arts to, uh, to partner with uh, NIH on the support of some of those music and health grants that she mentioned. Um, so last year, in partnership with the CDC, uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the CDC Foundation, uh, we helped support a grants program that awarded $2.5 million to 30 nonprofit organizations around the country to design and implement arts-based strategies for engaging communities around vaccine readiness. Our chair was in Atlanta recently, uh, just this month, to help launch a museum ex exhibit, exhibit of some of the artwork and communications tools that resulted from that effort. Uh, so to me, this is a perfect example of the arts growing importance and relevance to public health. Uh, we've also invested in studying this relationship more closely through an NIH uh, Research Lab Award the Epi Arts Lab at the University of Florida, where researchers over there are partnering with the epidemiology research team led by Daisy Fancourt in the UK, many of you know. Much in the same vein, last year we announced in partnership with Mid-America Mid Arts Alliance, uh, the very first recipients of Creative Forces Community Engagement Grants. That's 26 organizations that'll be supporting arts and health programs for military personnel, veterans, their families and caregivers in the communities where they live. This is an offshoot of the Creative Forces Clinical Program, which in partnership with the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs, offer creative arts therapies and conduct research and evaluation on outcomes for military connected patients who have post-traumatic stress and related psychological illnesses. Finally, just looking back over the last year, I wanna flag our partnership with the University of California, San Francisco, as part of the Sound Health Network. Uh, to provide a national resource center for researchers and practitioners in music and health. Uh, you should check it out. Uh, they've hosted a number of webinars and created a virtual platform for affinity groups covering music therapy, music education research, and music and health reimbursement services, for example. 
I urge you to check it out, as I said. And under this heading, I'll just add that I've been inspired, I use that word again, inspired by our other federal partners, um, NIH and also the National Science Foundation have taken an interest in the social and neural bases of creative movement or dance. Last year, we all helped to co-sponsor a workshop, a research workshop that I think generated a lot more momentum in this space. So looking ahead, um, at least in, the, in across government, um, I've really uh, also, uh, are, we've been privileged to be engaged with an HHS level working group, really an interagency working group on equitable long-term recovery and resilience which is doing a lot of conceptual work to understand and communicate how different pathways in providing federal services can better align with outcomes associated with health and human thriving. It's a whole of government approach for federal agencies cooperatively to strengthen conditions needed for improving individual and community resilience and well being nationwide. So the plan articulates several arts based strategies as critical to fostering what are called vital conditions for health, including belonging and civic muscle. Throughout this year, the working group is building out the model, a theory of change, and will begin to develop an aspirational measurement framework to support it. So those are some things um, going on right now, and I look forward to sharing more as we learn more. Thank you. We now want to um, turn to all of you for your questions. Um, I'm, I've been watching the chat, and there are zillions of them. It's <laughs> great. Um, we won't get to them all, but we'll do our very best. Um, Susan, I'm going to turn it over to you to moderate the questions using the Q&A feature. Wonderful. Thank you, Sunil and Emily. It's, it's, I just love this work. It, it's so dynamic, and there's so many things happening. Um, as Ruth said, it's going to take all of us to make this field a reality. And when you hear all of the extraordinary things that are happening, I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, there are so many questions. And um, I think uh, just as a reminder, this video will be available online um, on the Neural Arts Blueprint website. And you can also access now the 2022 progress report. It's available right on the homepage. So you know, feel free, some of you have asked about that. Um, so I'd like to just start um, by uh, Sunil, asking you to just uh, step back for a second, and uh, I think this NEA interagency task force is so interesting. Can you share a little bit more about um, sort of how that's going to operationalize and sort of what the group is really thinking about in the short term? Yes, thank you very much. And I want to, of course, acknowledge uh, Dr. Edwards and many others uh, who belong to this group, and we're really proud to have their participation. It's been meeting for uh, more than 10 years now on a fairly routine basis every quarter or so. And um, you know, we've done some gotten together for some collaborative projects here and there, uh, notably the one I mentioned on dance and creative movement, uh, I think emerged from some of those discussions, but also other efforts. And I think it's been a great connector across uh, a lot of our agency colleagues who we don't even suspect are very interested in these topics in, in different agencies that don't even have health in their name. Um, so that's been really, uh, it's really amazing to see. But that said, I, I think where we're moving with this, our chair, uh, Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson, has taken a lot of interest in this group and making it perhaps even more functional in terms of uh, maybe a, wor a true working group, um, as well as um, kind of a group that shares information and resources with each other, with the members. So um, she's looking into, per perhaps we're, we're going to actually talk to the group and figure out how we can expand and deepen it with maybe more resources, uh, and particularly around issues around uh, what we call civic infrastructure, so place-based type work uh, as it relates to public health and um, other um, kind of civic life, um, but also you know keeping the health focus. So we're we're in the process right now of stepping back to use your expression and thinking about um, this group a little bit of new, and then getting back together with the team and the members and going forward from there later this year. Right, thank you. There's a couple of questions that I'm going to try to weave together a little bit. Um, someone asked, is there a place or space online, a platform to connect with others for cooperative efforts? It's difficult to cut and paste from all the chats. Um, yes, you know, I think that's really one of the really great benefits of the neuro arts. Uh, resource center that we're building, which will be completed by the end of this calendar year. So we're rapidly working to step to step the the timeline up to make sure that we can do that. Um, on the Neuro Arts Resource Center, 
there will be um, a place for each organization, each individual, and I'll underscore individual, including artists, arts practitioners, researchers, and others to share their work and to share their contact information. So it's very easy to connect with each other. And there'll also be a place where we can create forums for specific topics and areas of interests or initiatives to be able to come together. So um, in the short term, um, it, I think we're, I would say we're building the plane, but um, but way uh, interested in trying to create those opportunities. As I said, this idea of the, the resource center is really a watering hole. Um, Ruth, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Also be the place where we will have information about funding opportunities for all of you um, to pursue your own work. So we will make that kind of information available uh, across the board. Yeah. So there's also, oh, sorry, I add something? Yes. In, you know, uh, one thing that I, I forgot to mention is that uh, DNIH uh, currently has put together a, a, a program uh, focus on uh, developing research networks. And those are not real regular grants. Those are um, actually uh, grants that are bringing people together to work together for a good four to five years. And so to me, that falls under the rubric of not only doing the research, but also building the community. Because what we're finding is that even though we continually ask uh, for interdisciplinary uh, teams to uh, you know, come together and submit application, those, um, you know, um, collaboration don't seem to be uh, yielding uh, what we're looking for. And so the idea was to actually develop uh, an opportunity for investigators to come together and work together uh, for a number of years so that they could actually truly uh, put together those interdisciplinary, uh, you know, uh, programs. Emily, that's, that's, that is, that is terrific, and that's absolutely consistent with one of our three building blocks, building community. That's what we got to do in all kinds of ways. So thank you. That's terrific. Yeah. And, and maybe just to add on to that, when we talk about interdisciplinary work, I think it's easy to say and hard to do. Um, yet we know that by bringing these different disciplines together, we can really address bigger problems and, 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 and move this work forward. And so this idea of frameworks or scientific methods that are highly interdisciplinary is something that we really need to um, roll up our sleeves on. And so there's a lots of opportunities to do that through NIH. We'll be introducing some other things through the blueprint over the next year or so to really look at what does it mean to do interdisciplinary work for arts and aesthetics. And Sunil, maybe just another shout out to the Sound Health Network, because in fact, the Sound Health Network is bringing together people interested in music and sound to think more deeply about this work too. So there are lots of opportunities that are in place and I think growing to be able to come together and, and, and find the groups that you're interested in, in collaborating with. So a couple other questions. Um, Emmeline, I'd love for you to talk a bit more. Um, I know that, that music and sound um, have been an area that uh, Francis Collins was very committed to and Renee and you have worked quite deeply in along with the um, NEA. Um, you know, the blueprint's really about lots of art forms and all the different art forms. And um, and we've loved watching how sound and music have really created some really wonderful um, standards and ways to move forward. But what's next? What's the next art form? So we actually recently uh, just had our first planning meeting for the workshop that we are going to have in the fall. And the workshop is really going to focus on a retrospective look at what we've accomplished, but prime, but also and very importantly uh, as to where we're going for the next five years, and um, we're going to be taking a little bit of you know baby steps. I think uh, we focus on music, and the group is thinking that maybe we should do something um, that also include music. So therefore, creative movement. Uh, is a very, um, you know, uh, appealing um, art form that we will be, uh, you know, considering. Again, this we are just at the beginning of our planning, but that's the direction that we would like to go with. We know that there is actually a, a, a group of very good investigators that are already working in those areas. So we would have, uh, you know, uh, a group of people that could actually uh, do rigorous research in that area. 
So that's wonderful. And and Emily, remind us that even if you're not working in the, those current art forms, um, you can still submit to, to NIH. Absolutely. You know, just because uh, you're not if you're not, um, you know, working on music or even in dance, uh, we have investigator initiated research. So uh, what I would advise anyone that's interested in submitting an application is to uh, contact uh, the, the program person at the particular institute of interest. So for example, if you're interested uh, in Parkinson disease, for example, um, the, neural, the Neurology Institute would be the, the natural home for that. So I would advise a uh, potential applicant to actually narrow down their focus and contact the right people and uh, discuss their potential application. And uh, they will get, you know, some feedback as to whether this is uh, an area of promise or whether the, the institute or center is interested in receiving their application. And and also, um, there is opportunities at NEA to also apply for research grants and other kinds of things. Sunil, do you want to talk a little bit about yeah, that? Thank you. Uh, absolutely. And we too, uh, maybe smaller scale of funding, but we do offer uh, grants and a lot of times these you know the investigators will do pilot work through our research funding and maybe go off and apply to maybe larger foundations or to NIH and it's it's a creates a great kind of stove stovepipe kind of process for building up research proof of concept um, so we have research uh, grants as well as what we call NEA research labs and the function of the NEA research labs is 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 actually transdisciplinary like we require two or more research disciplines to be represented on the team and then also partnering with artists and arts or arts organizations or art practitioners um, for a more longer term kind of research endeavor. So those two opportunities, research grants in the arts and any research labs on our website at arts.gov. And we're actually accepting, uh, I should say, we're in the middle of our grant cycle, uh, application cycle. So if you want to look now, now's the time. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, and, and I think it's also important to say that um, while the federal opportunities um, are spectacular, there are a number of um, foundations and um, uh, and small family foundations. There are local funders. Um, there are philanthropists that we are increasingly hearing more and more from and beginning to start to understand how arts, health, and research funders can work together in consortiums. And so I think over the next 12 to 24 months, we'll be able to start to really um, identify and work with some of those funders to help bring some of that resource forward. Um, and again, on the NeuroArts Blueprint uh, Resource Center, we will have funders, people that are interested in learning more about the work that we're doing there. And so I think, you know, this whole area around funding and sustainability uh, continues to be incredibly important. And it's a conversation that I think will start to become more front burner as we uh, continue to lay the foundation in these three building block areas that we've been talking about today. And don't forget state and local government, a number of them also support this kind of work. Yeah. It's not just the federal government. Yeah, and I'll just add that our grant making process, maybe unlike some others in the government, we require a match, a one to one dollar match. And a lot of times the match is provided by some of those foundations, some of those local governments, some other place. Um, not can't be a federal match, but non-federal match. And it's pretty remarkable to see the ingenuity that, that goes into uh, securing those funds and, and knowing, you know, reaching out and to groups they haven't spoken with before and getting the researchers more plugged in to other uh, areas, sources of funding and other opportunities. Susan, can I say something about the toolkit? So the, the NIH toolkit for music-based intervention is meant to um, later on to be actually updated and also expanded to other art forms as well, because the content really uh, emphasizes uh, having a conceptual model for the intervention or a framework, a mechanistic framework, but also it, it really delineates what's needed as building block for any intervention. So I think the NIH toolkit for music-based intervention can be adapted to other uh, art form. And when I say that we are developing funding opportunity announcement in that context, is that we want to actually test the validity of those principles that we laid out in that toolkit. 
And so um, I'm hopeful that we will be able to expand that to other art forms as well. Yeah. So in other words, the work that you've done in music and sound in terms can of be. protocol and outcome can transfer to other art forms. So, so laying the groundwork there, but it, but, but hopefully what you could easily see happening is that we'll have less learning in the next art form. So we'll be able to accelerate the, the, the pace of research as we start to learn from this. Exactly. Yeah. I'm going to try to combine a couple of other questions. Uh, so there's a number of people asking about different sectors, education sector, um, looking at the um, justice system, thinking about public health. And, you know, when we use these terms like um, arts practitioners um, or artists or researchers, you know, you have it's like oh, it's like peeling the onion. There are so many um, kinds of research that Ruth alluded to, whether that's economic research, cognitive neuroscience, public health, lived experience, um, uh, outcome based research. And so we're really counting all of that when we talk about research and, and that's messy, but it's super important to really understand the way the arts work and how we can translate that work more successfully and hopefully more broadly into solving some of the different issues that we've talked about in health and well-being. Um, for practitioners, we this is an open um, invitation, a, a table for all. Um, we think that folks working in the prison system can use this. Um, we've seen examples uh, where the arts have been used very successfully um, in, in a number of uh, justice um, uh, divisions. Also in schools, um, in K-12 and in college and university settings. So in terms of the practice, this work, if we if we do it right, we'll be able to um, uh, uh, fuse and and be used in all of those those different spaces. Um, you know, from a funding point of view, uh, I think we will be developing more of uh, policy uh, recommendations with many others. But the policy needs to look at policy for funding research and also funding practice. And they're 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 very interrelated, but they are separate sort of lanes. And so we're going to continue to think about how that kind of shows up over the next couple of years as well. Ruth, did you want to add to that? I just want to add to that to secure that kind of funding in either lane that Susan just just described. We do have to have the evidence to make the case for those who provide funding to want to make the investment. And so the research in all its many forms, Susan just, just described a number of them, are absolutely critical um, to help us make that case so that we in turn can develop policies, take the policymakers who ultimately we hope will, whether it's social prescribing or reimbursement under Medicare and Medicaid or private insurance for these kinds of activities, it's only going to happen if we have the evidence to back it up. So we're looking to you guys uh, to help provide that. Um, again, using many different ways to do the research and provide the research to us. Uh, just a quick um, note to one of the questions here. Yes, architecture and interior design are absolutely part of the neural arts blueprint work. And we think that uh, human built environment is really essential. And in fact, in the fall, uh, our lab at Hopkins will be hosting an event at 555 Pennsylvania Avenue, more to come, that's really looking at how do you create a translational model for research and practice in space design, in, in healthcare, in schools, et cetera. Um, so, so we'll definitely be talking more about that. Um, there's something in, there's another question in here from Linda Turner, and Linda, I want to lift this up, that while there's a lot of amazing work happening, in fact, um, there's also um, policy that's moving in the wrong direction, and um, so at the state level, some states are actually taking out legislation that would um, provide payment for, in this case, licensed creative arts therapists. Um, you know, in the policy realm, I think these are some of the issues that we need to lift up and we really need to, to think more about. Um, we've been looking really closely at Proposition 28 in California, where the arts are actually coming back into schools and they're coming into schools as much about um, uh, addressing some of the mental health crises that we're seeing now. And Sunil and Emily, I'd love for you to, to comment more on some of that if you could. 
So definitely, you know, the arts uh, are, are going to play a huge role into this um, us addressing this uh, mental health uh, crisis. At the NIH, we have uh, a number of research networks that are focused on emotional well-being. And we do have investigators that are actually looking at this right now. Um, in addition, um, we also, um, a couple of years ago, we actually had commissioned the National Academies to do a, a study on uh, factors that impact mental, uh, emotional, and behavioral development of our youth. And uh, we just recently actually had a funding opportunity um, focus on that, that uh, is gonna actually um, use the school systems and other community-based organization as the, um, the location for that research. And we are currently looking at a couple of very interesting application um, that we probably will fund in the next couple of months that are looking at different strategies, including the arts, uh, to uh, address uh, the mental, emotional, and behavioral development of uh, those young people. And I just want people to understand how transformative that is. And that's really significant that NIH is funding and is interested in research in school settings and in out of, out of the clinics, so to speak. Um, there's a lot of community-based research that NIH funds in that very way, community-based interventions, and people don't know about it a lot of times. Um, and so with NEA, we also, of course, fund research on arts education, particularly we've funded a lot of studies and continue to around social emotional development, but also uh, trauma um, regimens or, you know, arts educational programs where the, the, it's very intentional about uh, combating trauma or, um, and, and, and also the relationship to some mental health outcomes. Uh, we've, we've done that, a lot of that for a while, but um, I wanted to mention that, um, you know, there are other resources out there too. And so one of the things the NEA co-supports with the Department of Education is the Arts Education Partnership, which is another of these kinds of a big umbrella clearinghouse hubs, you know, that's in, our, in the field of arts education. And um, obviously that's a very vast field that not all of it includes things related to health or social emotional development, but they are increasingly getting into this space as well. So I think there are a lot of partners from different agencies and different constituencies that now are truly coming together in the way that's mapped out in neuro arts. And I would, I would also say that, you know, this, <clears throat> this idea of building evidence, building infrastructure, building community here um, can also now translate into education. And there's a lot of interagency commitments that are happening in that space as well. And I think a lot of opportunity as we build the evidence. Um, someone asked in the chat, um, are you collecting old research from other disciplines in the expressive arts or capturing newer research? Both. Um, we, our initial work, and, and you can find this on the Neuro Arts Blueprint website, actually went back 15 years and looked at all of the research the best way we could cut it, it, it's a little bit like apples, oranges, bananas, grapefruit, and a football. <laughs> uh, but because the naming and the taxonomy is really all over the place. Um, but what we were able to do was cobble together as much research as we could from the past 15 years. And now we're starting to organize and sort that. And that's another function of this resource center is to be able to put that work out in a way that you can easily search. So it's, it's easy to find more easily to to find what you're looking for if you're looking at a research study around a particular topic area. Uh, um, I'll just add to that, Susan. Some of that is captured in um, one of the documents you will find in the um, appendix to the blueprint. We did, um, before we even embarked on developing the blueprint itself, <clears throat> um, we did a, a, took a look at what was out there already to get a sense of where the burgeoning field was before we undertook our own work. And that report um, is actually part of the appendix, which is part of the bigger blueprint report. You can find all of that uh, on the uh, Neural Arts Blueprint um, uh, website. Yeah. There's a question in here that um, I wanna lift up. Um, is there a place for programs that are focused on mental and emotional health of artists? If so, what organizations might be appropriate to contact and get involved with? Um, are there training programs or workshops? This is a really important question because in my mind, artists have been frontline workers for the last four years and have really been out there in the communities 
And this work around trauma-informed care is so important for the artists. Um, we've been doing some work in, in this area in our lab with Tasha Golden, who is the director of research. But I will make sure, um, Sunil, I know you have resources here too, that we can um, come back to you in an email and share some very specific uh, organizations that could offer support here. I think it's really an important area of, of, of care. So I'm just mindful of the time. We're just about three minutes out. Uh, Sunil, Emily, Ruth, anything that anyone wants to add as we turn it over, Ruth, to you for some final comments? Only that we will, uh, Susan, I think you said this, we have dozens of questions that unfortunately we cannot get to, but um, we will, as we have in the past, um, answer them and put them up on the website so that we can share them with, with everyone. Um, and we thank you for, obviously, for um, all the interest. And it makes us think, too, to get these questions. They're really good ones. So don't go yet. Neil or, or um, Emily has anything to add. I just want to close out with something special. Uh, I just wanted to say that how important it is that we continue this work on capacity building of bringing uh, scientists together with uh, artists, uh, music therapists, or you know, art therapists. And so by building those communities, we're able to actually uh, educate each other of uh, you know, the particulars of each discipline. And to me, that's the way that we're going to make progress by working together. Great. And I've just been putting things in the chat uh, in a spirited manner while you all are talking as well. So I don't have any more comments to share. Other than it's been great to be here and really excited about the next phase of this work. Terrific. Thank you both again. It's We know how busy you are. We really appreciate your taking time from your busy schedule to join us. Um, Thank you. So, so to conclude today's webinar, we want to share a very brief video that we received from a community member which puts a face, literally a face, on why this work is so important and why all of us are so committed to it. I promise you it's no more than two minutes. It's well worth your hanging in there for the last two minutes to take a look at this. It will remind you of why we are here today and why we continue to do this important work. Thank you all for joining us. It's great to have you with us and we look forward to seeing you for our next webinar, if not soon. Thank you. Charlie has Down syndrome and at 16 developed Down syndrome regression disorder. He is now 31 and while he is mostly stable, he has never returned to the individual he was prior to his onset of symptoms. And what this means is that Charlie has greater challenges with short-term memory, following multi-step directions, and importantly, verbally communicating his feelings, experiences, and thoughts, especially when facing his mental health issues. My role is the environmental arranger. His art studio is set up with lots of written labels, signs, to-do lists, and even painting processes for his series. Charlie chooses his painting activities, and I provide the support for him to gather his canvases, paints, and tools. Charlie is free to create while I manage the space for him to be successful. I am essentially his art assistant. Charlie's favorite colors are greens and blues, but he also loves other happy colors, pink, orange, yellow, and he also adds shades of blacks and gray. He chooses his colors and composition. Charlie is the director in his space. And it's been exciting watching him evolve and the response of the world around him. Charlie is incredibly diligent. He paints and draws almost every day and has for many years. He wants to improve. He wants to sell his art. He loves to be successful. Charlie's art has sold around the world from New Zealand to Italy to Canada and he continues to dream about where his art can take him. Art has given Charlie ownership over his life. He chose his path, and for six years now, he has been all in, committed to his craft and career. He sees himself as a professional and is dedicated to his choice. He has purpose, success, his life is meaning, but mostly he has found a way to find joy through his struggles. Art is his happy place, and sharing that with the world has brought him and others great joy. And it is his insistence that he share the joy and not the pain he faces that is truly inspiring. His father and I could not be more proud of the human he is. <laughs>